And you can see my slides. Yes, we can uh, see. So very good to see you again after your uh, very successful interventional meeting in Antalya. We were very grateful for your hospitality. So it's good to meet you even from a distance. I want to say good morning to Achilleas uh, too, your co-chairman. Um, I'll just show a live in a box case of a TAVI. There's nothing spectacular about this case. It's just a day-to-day -day case that we do routinely in our lab and in everybody's lab. I just want to highlight some of the lifetime management considerations and all the routine adjustments we have uh, made, uh, us and other centers as well, to make the procedure safe and effective. So it's a 77-year-old female patient, diabetic on insulin with moderate renal impairment. There's a history of coronary disease, so this patient had a previous inferior myocardial infarction with a PCA of the right coronary artery, and the ejection fraction was um, somewhat reduced uh, with a 40% uh, with a moderate pulmonary hypertension, and she was significantly symptomatic in YHA class 3. There was significant aortic stenosis, you can see the numbers here, and the Euroscore of this patient was calculated at 4.13%. So these are some of the features of the CT scan. You can see a tri-leaflet aortic valve with moderate degree of calcification, the speckles of calcium in the ascending and descending aorta. The anatomy is small, so the perimeter derived um, annulus is 21.6, 21.2 the area and the LVO2 is 20 millimeters, and, but the height of the coronary ostea is both okay, 15 and 13. Um, this is the uh, aortic tree. You can see there's a lot of calcification, especially on the abdominal aorta and the left um, iliac artery. The right looks a little bit better, still calcified though, as you'd expect for a diabetic uh, elderly woman, that, but the diameters look fine. And this is the anatomy of the cranial artery. So there's somewhat bovine, but borderline bovine. Uh, the left, uh, the right carotid is coming off at an angle from the anonymous artery on the right. So clearly it's a relatively young patient, it's below 80. There is a known coronary disease, so likely to require further angiography, so small anatomy. So I have to consider all this. So our plan was to implant an accurate neo 2 size small valve because it's a supraannular valve, so it has favorable hemodynamics. There is the potential of easy commissural alignment, which um, helps a lot both with the hemodynamics of the valve, but also with the axis of the coronaries. And we plan to use cerebral protection device with this. The procedural planning, planning would be the primary axis from the right femoral artery. In our, it is our routine to do a cut down on that, and we've been doing so for the last three and a half years with great success, so we don't steer away from that. There is a radial, right radial axis using a sentinel protection and left radial axis using the pigtail and the left femoral vein with a short wire uh, to use the pacing from the LV wire. So we don't use any temporary wire for that. Um, I don't know if the, there are any comments on the case or on the planning, uh, anything you want to add to or Achilleas or any from the audience before I show the case. It's a short case, so it's not going to take too long of your time. Uh, it's a uh, little bit small annulus, and in the small yeah. annulus anatomies, usage of the both um, other supranar valve and the balloon expandable valve, we will use a small valve. It looks like 21, or maybe if you've got an intermediate size. Uh, but uh, in this case, the selection of the valve, I think, good uh, because of the. But um, maybe we can ask about. Um, properties of the accurate neo, for example, I think you routinely use balloon, larger balloons. In that kind of anatomy, for example, will you use a larger balloon or uh, what will the be plan, your selection? The plan would be to predilate with a 20 millimeter balloon. Uh, it's a 20 millimeter LVOT, 21 millimeter perimetry uh, diameter of the annulus, so just predilation with a 20, and then use a size small, 23 millimeter um, accurate NEO2. Now, being a supraannular valve, it gives you favorable hemodynamics, and it doesn't have the closed frame uh, that you have in other supraannular technologies, so coronary access uh, is feasible quite easily with this technology from above. And also, you have the, I will demonstrate on the case, 
how easy it is to perform commissural alignment. So yeah, because this is, I will ask to you, yes. Exactly. You so commissural alignment is very, very easy with this valve and I will show it in a, in a case. It takes just uh, 30 seconds to one minute to do so. So I, I guess uh, in, in what uh, was asked earlier, I think that the most important thing here is to uh, keep in mind that this is a relatively young patient and uh, you're going to have to intervene in the coronaries at some point further down the road. Um, therefore, you know, I, I, will, I wouldn't agree more with uh, the uh, picking that valve, that specific valve. It has a very good profile and um, very good numbers to support a good uh, coronary access after implantation. However, uh, having said that, I, you know, um, and just to be, in, you know, for the argument, uh, sake of the argument, I would say that uh, maybe a small uh, balloon expandable valve will also do the trick, um, although I wouldn't go there as my first choice. And prothesis patient mismatch also is a very important small, small analysis to predict the long-term mortality, and so in this case, I think it's a very good selection. In the discussion, yeah, about we were we were somewhat um, uh, swayed away from using balloon expandable valves in the recent uh, results of the smart smart trial in the small anatomies. You see, so I think a supraanular prosthesis in this particular size would be my first choice. Of course, if you go to medium or large sizes, it's a different story. Then balloon expandable would definitely be a very good choice as well. For the sake of the discussion about uh, lifetime management, uh, Vlasis, uh, would you consider um, also the possibility of valve in valve uh, possibility in the future for this particular valve? Now, obviously, the, the goal is now to get a, a new valve in there to work for this, uh, to, to relieve the critical stenosis. But uh, number one, I would consider, would you consider the possibility of this valve that you're going to implant for valve in valve in the future? And yeah, absolutely. There's uh, good data that shows that a balloon expandable valve can fit easily in the frame of the accurate Neo2. That leaves you again, the coronary is unaffected. And because it's a second valve in valve, it uh, gives you um, a relatively bigger area compared to two balloon expandable valves. Plus, you don't have the worry of uh, the, the tall skirt of, um, say, uh, a closed cell uh, supraannular valve that could potentially uh, create any uh, sinus sequestration, any blockages at the level of the sinotubular junction, et, et cetera. So the valve-in-valve -valve option is there for this uh, technology as well. Would you also consider an intra-annular self-expanding valve? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. That would also work. That, that is a very, very good point because you have an annular leaflet, short skirt, and then potentially you can have the favorable de de hemodynamics as well as the future access to the coronaries. That's a very good point, uh, Michaelis, I agree. So, if you, in the interest of time, I can move on to the case. So, hemodynamics are top left, our uh, table is on the, on the top right and the fluoro, you can see. This is uh, Konstantinos Papazoglu pushing uh, very elegantly the long sheath in. It takes for him about five seconds, but we trust him. We never had any issues with that. So the next step is left radial for the pigtail. You can see pigtail is moving in uh, to get uh, access. First, we'll do um, an injection to visualize the cranial arteries, um, just to, to show uh, the anatomy in order to uh, implant the sentinel device. And as I said, we do that as a routine. I mean, you can argue whether you know this is absolutely necessary or not. You can argue about the data. I totally agree, but we have had some very impressive fishing uh, elements out. You can see now the um, anatomy, it's sort of bovine, it's not 100% bovine, but there is a bovine element. So our practice uh, here will be to uh, push through the right radial artery along 300 centimeter um, wire, coronary wire, that will uh, end up in the ascending aorta. And then over this wire, we will um, push the sentinel device. You can see now the sentinel is going in on the left. So the uh, um, procedure is first to deploy the proximal basket, uh, which is quite easily done. We have our anatomic landmarks. And then by flexing the distal uh, basket, you can see there, we can rotate and with some persuasion the coronary wire will end up into the uh, carotid on the left 
I think in this particular case we changed wire because it was the tip was a little bit damaged, so we just in, inserted a new wire. But uh, that that made it uh, quite easy to go up to the carotid. Sometimes it takes a little bit of manipulation to do so. But usually it's not that difficult. See, the wire is going up, we're pulling the system, and then we're just pushing the distal basket. So once this is secured in place, then the next step will be to take our uh, aortic root view by um, advancing the pigtail to the aortic root. And then once we're in position, we try to take a view that shows uh, both cusps aligned. We only use the uh, three cusp view, but we need to make sure that they're, all the three cusps are aligned properly. We don't need to swing from the three cusp to the cusp overlap view uh, for implantation purposes. We do that only to ensure commissural alignment. So that saves contrast and uh, fluoroscopy with this particular technology. It makes it quite simple. Then the next step will be to cross the valve. And you can see here, we do that with a straight wire. Some people use a pigtail on that, but usually straight wire, if we have taken the fluoroscopy, it, takes, it doesn't take that long. You can see now the wire uh, crossing in without any problems. AL1 goes in. Then we change with a, a long exchange wire coronary. For most centers with high volume experience, these are automatic uh, maneuvers. And then after getting the exchange wire inside the left ventricle, then we uh, put a pigtail, which you will see in a minute. It's very important to avoid papillary muscles because papillary muscles uh, will uh, deflect the wire and uh, will make the LV very irritable. For this particular valve, it's very important that we have a nice, comfortable position of the safari wire inside the left ventricle. And we need to make sure that the wire um, loop will be facing upwards. So you will see that. We'll take the gradient first. So here you can see there's a gradient um, about uh, 30 millimeters of mercury and then we're just threading the wire inside the uh, pigtail so this is the position of the wire so you can see it's very important that the loop is facing upwards and the wire follows the outer curve of the ascending aorta this is the position that you need to have when you implant accurate neo2 so now the next step will be to predilate uh, pre the valve using a 20 millimeter balloon under rapid pacing. And as I mentioned, the pacing, we don't use a, a temporary wire because these valves have a very low probability of having a temporary wire. We would only use it if we have a pre-existing right bundle branch block. So this is the balloon going in and the, you can see the, the, the black uh, clip will go to the wire, to the safari and the red is uh, on the venous sheath on a wire that uh, is in the blood pool. So now we will pace at 180 beats per minute and we will inflate. So we inflate. Okay. Pretty straightforward. And then we will implant the valve in a minute. So, the valve is quite flexible. It follows uh, the curvature quite easily without many issues. The sheath that we use is a 14 French and it's expandable. So the valve is inserted using a little sheath, a little insertion aid that you can see in my fingers, in my hands. That takes a little bit of effort to expand the sheath and then it follows all the way up to the arch and down to the root. Now in this particular situation we need to make sure we have commissural alignment. So we look at the three posts up there that um, if two are on the left and one on the right, we anticipate that we have to rotate clockwise in order for them in the three-cusp view to be totally aligned. 
And uh, what we do now is we move to the cusp overlap view and we rotate the handle clockwise so that we can see a free strut there on the right and two cells and two uh, posts on the left. So this is as easy as it gets. Mm -hmm. It's very visible and uh, it takes just a minimum effort, usually a few seconds to rotate. And then we're in good position. We just implant so that this marker in the middle of the valve uh, is at the bottom of the pigtail. Is Most of the times we pace at 100 bits per minute to minimize any motion and then we just deploy the valve from the top to the uh, bottom. So first we uh, open the crowns, we just recheck the position, then we will open the arches that will center the valve and will make it stable. It's a process that takes a few seconds. Patients are usually tolerating that without any problems. Uh, is it is there any importance of the flash port position um, for the commissural alignment? Plus Correct. It uh, it is. We usually insert it at uh, six o'clock. So by having it at six o'clock, um, it gives you eighty to eighty-five percent probability that you will end up in the commissural alignment. And uh, then you can see the opening of the uh, stand frame that is very fast, and then we just resheath the whole assembly and then we take it out. Now you can see the three posts of the valve there, they're equally spaced in the cusp overlap, uh, in the three cusp view. That you, having done all the work that before, it shows that we're commissurally aligned 100%, but in order to document that, we need to move over to the right side, to the area codal, to the cusp overlap view, and then you will see the two posts on the left side and the one post on the right side that confirms the commissural alignment. If it's the other way around, that means you're totally misaligned and we don't want that to happen. Of course, having done all the procedure that we did before, all the steps, it's very unlikely that this will happen. But um, because it's a 60 degree rotation between one position to the other, to the full alignment, from, from the full alignment to the full misalign misalignment, uh, we need to take these steps. So. First, we take out the wire, we put a pigtail in. With this valve, it's, and you can see the hemodynamics are great, no gradient, and nice separation of the diastolic curves. It's very important not to lose your wire position in this valve, because if you want to recross, you need to take care, uh, and you can see there's no PVL, you need to take care that you go through the valve and not through one of the arches, because that could potentially create problems if you want to post dilate with a balloon. So it's one of the things that you need uh, to take care. So now we're happy with the hemodynamics and uh, just for the sake of demonstration we roll over to the RAO codal to the cusp overlap view and now you will see I think I've seen it, it yeah so you can see here two uh, posts on the left one on the right and that is a, a proof that we are uh, commissurally aligned 100% so uh, I think uh, pretty much uh, this is the case. Uh, this is the removal of the Sentinel. Um, so after taking the pigtail out, uh, we go up and then we just um, resheathe the distal basket and then the unflex the distal system and then resheathe the proximal basket. And uh, we always try to, to see what we captured. In this particular case, we captured this. So lots of white stuff, white clothes or debris or, I don't know, calcium. So, you know, maybe nothing could have happened before if we haven't put the sentinel, but who knows, you know, that's uh, the unknown of these uh, procedures. So patient did very well, uh, discharge on day three with an eventful recovery with single digit gradients and no PVL. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm open to discussion and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willis. It's an excellent case. Um, is there any question from the panel and from the audience? Uh, I will ask one question uh, for the uh, alignment, commissural alignment. Uh, the system looks uh, pretty flexible and you can return it inside compared to the other system. Now, other systems are, are also focused on this point, I think, Willis. What do you think about this? 
I think it's one of the best systems to perform commissural alignment um, because the, the markers right now in this iteration of the device, and I know the company is preparing another iteration that uh, probably will make it even easier, but in this iteration you have two clear uh, markers. One is the posts that you can align before and one is the free cell that when you have it on the right side in the cusp overlap view, you know you're commissurally aligned. It's very flexible and it's very safe to rotate. Even rotation over 360 degrees um, is um, acceptable. The main thing is when you reach to your position to let the system dissipate. So uh, get your hands off the system and let it torque, uh, torque back so that there's no stored tension. Otherwise, when you open the valve, it will continue to rotate and then it will lose the alignment. Thank you. Okay. No. Okay, uh, uh, I see there are no more questions, and I think we had a wonderful uh, session. I would like to congratulate all the uh, participants and the, um, uh, and the panel. Um, 